Hey, Smart People Joe here. Stay tuned for a special announcement after the video. So I used to have this shirt. I know at least one of you was watching back in 2013. Hey Kyle. Now for the rest of you, you're probably wondering the same thing as me. What is up with the hair? What this shirt means is that the microbes in and on our bodies outnumber our own cells. The most common figure is by 10 to one. Except that's not true. It's a scientific urban legend. Yet this continues to be shared and recited as fact. I mean, I'm guilty of it too. My old video is called Your Mainly Microbe and it is literally centered around this erroneous factoid. <laughs> It turns out that urban legends like this are surprisingly common even in science and how they begin and why they persist can teach us a lot about how science works and when it doesn't. At some point, the 10 to one bacterial to human cell ratio became common knowledge. A common knowledge is information that the average educated person in some group, the general public, scientists, whoever, accepts as reliable without having to look it up. Like how we all know that water freezes at zero degrees Celsius. We all know that, right? Now, somewhere along the line, people stopped asking where this common knowledge came from. Well, there are countless facts in science that have become common knowledge. I mean, if research papers cited an original source for every single fact they presented, it would be an absolute mess. I mean, say you wrote a paper about synthesizing some new chemical. Do you have to cite a paper that proves chemicals are arrangements of different atoms? Or, okay, then do you have to cite something that proves atoms exist? Uh, maybe Einstein's 1905 paper on Brownian motion, or do you have to go back to John Dalton in the early 1800s? You can see that things get pretty ridiculous pretty fast. But sometimes things that aren't true become common knowledge, or they're corrected later, but the new information fails to replace the old idea. Here's an example. I wouldn't be surprised if at some point in your life, you probably heard that spinach was a particularly excellent source of iron. I mean, I certainly remember being taught that. I can't even remember where. Oh, you can probably guess where I'm going with this. It's not true. In 1981, a biologist named Terry Hamblin studied historical science papers and realized that the iron content in spinach was misreported thanks to a misplaced decimal point way back in the early 1900s. Except he didn't cite a source for the misplaced decimal point story either. And it turns out that that's a myth too. Turns out the earliest old school measures of iron and spinach were way too high and wrong, but because of contamination, not a misplaced decimal point. It's science, details matter. Spinach actually does contain large amounts of iron, as much as red meat in some cases, but it also contains compounds that make the iron it does have harder for us to absorb. So, it's not an exceptionally great source of iron. Incidentally, it turns out Popeye creator E.C. Seeger chose spinach as the sailor man's food of choice for its high vitamin A content, not because of iron. It's another case where the correction never seems to spread as wide as the lie, and it's a good reminder that a good story is not necessarily a true story. And I'm willing to bet at some point in your life you've taken vitamin C to help cure or prevent a cold. Yeah, that's not true either. That myth traces to legendary scientist Linus Pauling. In 1966, Pauling was convinced by a random dude named Erwin Stone that taking large doses of vitamin C would help him live longer. And Pauling started taking doses equivalent to hundreds of glasses of orange juice every day, and wrote books and articles claiming that the colds he had suffered from his whole life no longer occurred. Even though Linus Pauling won two solo Nobel Prizes in his life, dozens of studies have since proven he was wrong about vitamin C. It doesn't significantly affect colds, and the only disease it definitively prevents is scurvy. Yet somehow the cold myth still continues today. Or maybe you've heard that you lose most body heat through your head. Well, that urban legend goes back to one military study in the 1950s where people were left out in the cold with no hats on. I mean, you're gonna lose most of your body heat through your head if that's all that's exposed. Today, scientists know the amount of body heat you lose depends on the total surface area exposed. But parents everywhere are still making sure you don't leave home without a hat. 
You also don't need to drink eight glasses of water a day. That urban legend probably goes back to one set of dietary recommendations for water intake from 1945. Except many people who cited that number ignored the part where it said most people get the majority of water they need from food. It's important to stay hydrated, but eight glasses, I mean like, what size of glasses even? And one of the most famous is that sugar causes hyperactivity in children. Uh, this one seems totally logical, but more than a dozen randomized controlled trials have failed to detect different behavior between kids given large doses of sugar and kids who weren't. That's right, the cake is actually a lie. Turns out when parents even think their children have been given a drink containing sugar, even if it's actually sugar free, they tend to think their kids are being hyperactive. This particular urban legend traces its origin back to a California allergy doctor, Benjamin Feingold, in 1973, who with little to no evidence recommended removing artificial colors and flavors from the diets of hyperactive children. And I guess people were like, why not sugar too? I mean, kids are just kids and they're gonna go nuts sometimes. Let's go back to that 10 to one mainly microbe cell number from the beginning. In 2010, a couple of researchers went on a deep dive to find the original source, and the paper cited most often was this one from 1977. It states the human body contains 100 trillion microbial cells and 10 trillion of its own cells, 10 to one. Scroll down to reference number 70 and we find the source of the 100 trillion microbial cell number is this paper by Thomas Lucky, which when we read the paper, turns out was just a back of the envelope estimate and wasn't based on any actual experiments. This has nothing to do with the rest of the video, but I just have to mention Dr. Lucky was literally an honorary samurai, which is awesome. And going back to the original 1977 paper, the human cell number comes from reference number 27, a textbook by biologist Theodosius Dobzhansky. I dug through the internet to find a copy of it, and right there in chapter one, with absolutely zero supporting evidence, is the claim that a human body contains 10 trillion cells. And there you have it, a back of the envelope estimate combined with a totally unsupported approximation to create the very wrong and very widely shared fact that human cells are outnumbered by microbes 10 to one. Right about now, you're probably wondering what the real numbers are. First, the original estimate for microbes living inside us was calculated using the volume of the entire intestine. But the vast majority of your body's microbes live in your colon, which is only a portion of that volume. And yes, that is where your poop is made. Using a more accurate volume of the average colon and the number of bacteria that we typically find per volume of poop, in 2016, researchers calculated that your inner microbial population is, drum roll please, 39 trillion, not 100 trillion. And as for the number of cells in the human body, this is a seemingly simple question that you might assume we biologists have known for a long time. But the truth is, until very recently, no one really knew. Over the past couple centuries, estimates have ranged from five billion to more than a quadrillion cells in our body. What makes it so difficult is that our cells vary hugely in size and how tightly packed they are. So the only way to get a good count is to estimate each organ individually. And that's what a group of researchers did in 2013. Based on actual evidence, their new number is 37.2 trillion cells in the average human body. That makes the ratio of microbe to you more like one to one, pretty much even Stevens. Amazingly, although most of your mass comes from muscle and bone cells, by sheer number, red blood cells make up more than 80% of the cells in your body. But remember how I said almost all of your inner microbes live in your colon? Well, you lose almost a third of them every time you have a bowel movement, so every time you poop, the ratio swings in your favor, at least for a few hours until they get their numbers back up. That doesn't make quite as catchy of a shirt though. Things we consider common knowledge can be based on bad information. And despite the amazing power of science to correct its own mistakes and uncover better and better knowledge over time, that good knowledge doesn't always spread out and replace the bad knowledge. So how do these scientific urban legends continue to persist? 
More scientific journals exist today than ever before, and we're doing more science today than ever before. Most of that science is peer-reviewed, but peer-reviewed doesn't always mean something is true. If one false citation makes it into the system, it can set up a domino effect as other people cite that very bad fact instead of verifying the original. The solution? Well, for you out there in the general public at least, wherever you can, even if you think something is common knowledge, try to learn where it came from. You might be surprised by what you find, but that is easier said than done because most published science today isn't freely available, at least not legally. Most scientific research today sits behind paywalls. So even if you wanted to check a source, you couldn't. Then what about this? Now it is easy to dump on Wikipedia. Anyone can edit it. And I mean, they have an entire page titled Wikipedia is not a reliable source. Whoa, that's a paradox. Wait, why don't I have a Wikipedia page? Come on, Kyle. But Wikipedia represents a collection of our common knowledge. It's the most widely read and widely accessible information source on Earth. And at least one study has shown that Wikipedia pages are more likely to cite scientific sources that are freely available. Now, this isn't an ad for Wikipedia. It just seems like if you want to get good science out to the broadest audience, making it freely available is not a bad place to start. The point, to me at least, is pretty clear. If you want common knowledge to be true, you have to let true knowledge be common. Every one of us carries quite a few pieces of incorrect knowledge in our heads, and that has nothing to feel bad about. What matters is being comfortable enough with the idea of not knowing everything that you're able to replace bad knowledge when you find better knowledge. Stay curious. Hey there. If you are still watching this far into the video, it's because you really love It's Okay to Be Smart, or you're just too lazy to click the next video. Either way, I have got a special announcement for you. It's Okay to Be Smart is now on Patreon. I thought there would be fireworks or something, but for the longest time, so many of you have been asking if we have a Patreon, if there's some other way that you can be a part of the show, and the answer is yes, now we do. It kind of feels like I'm the last YouTube channel on Earth to launch a Patreon page, but I'm really excited to be able to share and interact with you guys in new ways and together to make this channel grow even more. Now, on the Patreon page, you get to see a whole bunch of stuff that no one else gets to see, like behind the scenes photos, some extra videos, and special posts from me featuring stuff that doesn't make it into the videos. How'd that go? We like how that went? <laughs> and a whole lot more, like maybe special merch, or our own Discord. You're just gonna have to go and check it out and see. There's links to the Patreon page at the end of the video, down below the video. I basically put them everywhere I could. So definitely head over there to learn all the different ways that you can join our family. Now I make this show to tell stories about science, to teach people, and as a celebration of how much fun it can be to learn something new. By joining our Patreon, you'll help me and the rest of the team focus more on science and facts and less on algorithms and ads. I am so lucky that I get to tell stories and teach science for a living, and I could not have grown this over the past six years without you. Thank you for your support, however you show it. I'm really excited to see what we can make together. By the way, you might wanna go back and check if there's really seven urban legends in this video. Like I said, always check your sources. You know, I always cite my sources, they're down in the description. Go have a look, and hit the bell on your way down.